It has finally arrived, Notre Dame fans. It's Clemson week. Welcome to Here Come the Irish, an exclusive show to all members of the Notre Dame Giving Society. Vic Lombardi joined by Ryan Harris. And Ryan, I'm sure you're like me. When the schedule came out, you circled this game. Couldn't wait for this game. We have this game finally. We have it. And even though it's not going to be a packed house and it's not going to be under the lights at a packed house, this has all the feelings of a big game. I got the most media requests I've had all season just this week about Clemson. Everybody's interested. They're even talking about it here on our station, Vic, here in Denver. And it is it is going to be a game for the ages. Legends are made in games like these at the University of Notre Dame. As a competitor, I'm not sure how players and coaches think, but as a fan and a competitor, I wanted to see Trevor Lawrence play in this game because – if he doesn't play and the Irish win, you know what you're going to hear, right? Oh, well, they didn't. if you lose and he doesn't play, then it's the worst case scenario. So I think there's a no-win situation. I mean, you want to win the game, but I would prefer Trevor Lawrence to play. And, and so does Coach Kelly. He said that to us on the broadcast after the game last week against Georgia Tech. He said, you know, we're, it sucks. We want him to be there. We want to play the best. These guys have been waiting for this opportunity. And I can tell you, Vic, as a former Notre Dame athlete, that's why you come to Notre Dame. You come to Notre Dame to compete in the classroom and compete on the field against the best in both places. And unfortunately, it looks like it may not happen. But I do think, Vic, now this is a little bit of – I got my tinfoil hat on oh. here. But, but I mean, Trevor Lawrence, they announced that he was going to travel with Clemson to Notre Dame, yeah. which I thought was interesting. If he's not going to play, why is he traveling? I wouldn't be surprised if, he, if they pull a quick one, Dabo Sweeney, and tell on Saturday morning, tell people that he is going to start. Now, I'm not sure I'd go that far, but I did raise my eyebrows when I saw that he would make the traveling party because I, I wondered about that. What what role will he play as a member of the traveling party on the sideline? Does he just want to see the campus? Who knows? Maybe well, maybe yeah. he wants to grad transfer or something. I, I don't know. But I, what you you serious about that? You really believe that he could show up and suit up on Saturday? Number one, never trust an opposing coach. That's a that's a law in football. And absolutely, you know, because Dabo Sweeney, that he wants to prove to everyone that he can beat Notre Dame with or without Trevor Lawrence as well. And and I think that Trevor Lawrence also sees, because Vic, this is going to be interesting as we get in here to the college football playoffs, when those college football playoffs are, especially if you're a guy like Trevor Lawrence, who's projected to be the first or second pick overall, you're going to have to start making some business decisions as that calendar moves. So I think he's also looking at this and say, I want this opportunity. I want to play at Notre Dame. And I know from playing opponents at Notre Dame, they want to come in and win at Notre Dame. That's a that's a career highlight for any quarterback. Yeah. And, you know, Tyler Pelko reminded me of that when I was his teammate in Kansas yeah. City. I mean, it happens too. It happens at t from time to time. And it's, a, and it's something that people remember for their teams for the rest of their life. This matchup reminds me so much of when I was in school, 1988, number one ranked Miami visits South Bend, came in with a big win streak. The Irish at the time were ranked number four, and Notre Dame goes on to win that game 31-30 in a thriller. Now, later in the show, you're going to visit with a fella who I happen to know really well, who was a big, big reason why Notre Dame won that game, and I can't wait to hear that interview. You and Rocket Ismail, huh? Yeah, Rocket's, Rocket's a fantastic person. Everybody who knows him loves him. Uh, he's so passionate, so full of life. And he has a background story about the fight in the tunnel when Miami came in on a 36-game win streak, just like Clemson's coming in this week on a 36-game win streak. He talks about what happened in that fight in the tunnel and what Coach Holt said after, and everyone is going to love it. Well, I'll never forget the, um, the press conference, that coach – not the press conference, the pep rally the night before – when Lou Holtz looks out in the crowd and, you know, he's always poor mouthing the opponent saying, you know, they're a great team, blah, blah. But he looked out in the crowd and he said, we're going to beat the dog out of Miami tomorrow, man. And at what? that point I said, oh, Notre Dame's going to win this game. Notre Dame's well, going to win this game. And this is what college football is all about, right? You're not, not every game is like this. This isn't the NFL where there's so much talent on the field. I mean, the, the booth is going to be filled with NFL scouts, but I, this is what every fan wants. How does your team match up against the number one team in the country? And Notre Dame fans are going to get to see that Saturday night. What about the argument, Ryan, that um, – and, and I know it's hard to assess in the COVID season, 
that Notre Dame really hasn't played anybody yet, and this will be their first true test. I guess the same thing can be applied to Clemson. What's the difference? What has uh, Clemson played? That, thank you. That's what I said yeah. on SiriusXM this week. I said, it's not like Clemson's been playing world beaters either. Yeah. I mean, every, they're both in the ACC. So finally, now Notre Dame kind of gets to break that that kind of age-old adage of, well, Notre Dame really hasn't played anybody. They're not in a conference. Well, well, how come it's respect for Clemson and who they beat, but not respect for Notre Dame and, and, and what they've done to be undefeated this point this season? It, it's baffling, but they get the chance to prove it tomorrow on, on Saturday night. And, and Vic, I can tell you as a player, there are no more opportunities that you want in your life as a player than to prove yourself against the best and say, see, I told you so. Let's keep this going. And Notre Dame has that opportunity. All right. Um, let's assume Trevor Lawrence does not step foot on the field as a player and they go with the uh, the freshman. Have you nailed the name down yet? Go ahead. Give it a shot. DJ Ui Lagulale. How'd I do? Come on, man. Come on. Ui Lagulale. You're, you're a professional broadcaster. You messed it up already. You know, I, I thought I nailed it. Try it. Try it one more time. DJ Ui Lagulale. No. Yeah, I'm feeling good about that. I'm feeling don't, good. Don't spit that out there on Saturday. I'm feeling good. Do I need to practice it again? Oh, let's, let's, let's. The, hey, first of all, you have to throw the N in there. Uingalele. 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 Yeah, Uingalele. Uingalele. Yeah, there's no N in the Ui, name. Or Ui Ungalele. Ui Ungalele. There you go. Ui Ungalele. Got it. Don't you want to go to Hawaii just saying his name? I, do. I, mean, I just do. I want I to do. go so bad. <laughs> what do you think about this kid? The one, the one game you saw from him, and it was a comeback of epic proportions because it looked like they were going to get beat. It looked like Boston College had their number. And this kid, he showed some poise there in the second half. He really did. And and what I watched on watching that Boston College game, first off, Boston College made about every play that was humanly yeah. possible. I mean, they had huge downfield catches. They didn't have a single mistake, and they also only scored 28 points in that first half. But when you talk about DJ, oh, Ui Ungalele. Ui Ungalele. Ui Ungalele. When you talk about DJ Ui Ungalele, one of the things that stood out right away is I'm watching the film, and he kept missing to his left. And I said, you know, he can't throw to his left. And then I do my, my research routine. I always like to watch the film first to get my own impression. I learned that from Mike Tomlin at the Pittsburgh Steelers. So he can't throw left. Well, I go to profootballfocus.com, and in their college reports, he was two for six to his left, and the only two completions were of five yards. And one of the things they said is, as a quarterback, when you throw to your left as a right-hander, you have to use that three-quarter release. And DJ Ui Ungalele came over the top, and that was creating some of the incompletions. I mean, he missed five yards wide open receivers who are 15 yards down to his left. So it's going to be really interesting to see how Clark Lee really t- tunes up that defense to go against DJ Ui Ungalele. Well, you know, the guy right behind him that's going to get the ball a lot is a load, and he'll be the best running back. I think he's the best running back in the country. He'll be yes. the best back the, the Irish have seen here in a couple of years. Travis Etienne can run the football. Absolutely. But he's also never gone against a safety like Kyle Hamilton or the best linebacker in the entire college football landscape in Jeremiah Wusu koromoa So it's also going to be a big game for Dalen Hayes. I mean, these defensive stalwarts have to show up big. And you're right. I mean, Clemson uses uses Travis Etienne like the Saints use Elvin Kamara. He, he runs the football. He catches it out of the backfield. He does what, unfortunately, we remember as Notre Dame fans, that Reggie Bush, they call it the wheel route, where you go out to the flat and go up yeah. and north and south up the field, and he's very effective. And they have not played a team so technically sound as Notre Dame, even Dabo Sweeney talking about the success of Notre Dame and how they've impressed him, especially defensively, this week. You mentioned Dalen Hayes. He was player of the game as Brian Kelly awarded him afterwards in that Georgia Tech game. He was a beast. He was all over the place. What did you think about the Irish performance against G Tech? Well, I always love it when players prove me right. And watching the film, I saw the left tackle for Georgia Tech as a liability, and I hate saying that as a former left tackle. But Dalen Hayes, it's one thing to have an opportunity. It's an entire other thing to make the most of it. And Dalen Hayes did that, not just with his sacks, his hurries as well. He's so fast. He really looks like a man amongst boys on one of the best defenses in the entire college football landscape. So he just stands out, and I said it on the broadcast, 
He made himself a lot of money in that game against Georgia Tech. Okay. Last question, because uh, Ian Book threw for 199 yards against Georgia Tech. We saw him have a field day against Pittsburgh. Do you expect Clemson to stack the box, force Notre Dame to pass, and put the game in the hands of Ian Book? Absolutely, and that's based on their defense by design. They play a single high defense. We'll get into it with Aiden Thomas here mm -hmm. in a little bit from the Observer. But the people doubt Ian Book's capabilities. But I, I looked at it, pro football focus, the average time for him for a completion from when he gets the football to when he throws it is 2.4 seconds. That's incredibly fast. To give you an example, Peyton Manning, when I played with him, was at about 2.55 or 2.4. And what that shows is Ian Book has a mastery of the offense. He knows where he wants to go with the football before he even gets it in his hands. And he'll have plenty of opportunities, Ben Skoranek, Joe Wilkins as well. As, and don't count out Michael Mayer, who I think will play a huge role in this game because they play single high safety with man-to-man -man coverage. It's rare you see that in college football because you can get burned easily, and that's what Boston College did, and I believe that's what Notre Dame's going to do as well. All right, before we go on with the interviews here on Here Come the Irish, how about a look back, a recap of last week's victory at Georgia Tech. as upset-minded Georgia Tech welcomes unbeaten and fourth-ranked Notre Dame. Yeah, Ronnie Stanley of the Ravens just got that huge contract the other day. Big hole here off the right side for Kyron Williams. Inside the 25. Trying to slow the run game down. Here's Book rolling out to his right. Pass to the end zone is caught for a touchdown. Joe Wilkins. Gain of 11 on Williams on that last play. And here comes a jet sweep to Tyree with blockers out in front. First and goal from the Georgia Tech two yard line. And they just plow straight ahead now on fourth down and two. Notre Dame 50% on fourth down defensively, but that's going up as Kyle Hamilton. Try to extend the lead here. Georgia Tech does have two timeouts remaining. Sims in trouble, fumbles the ball as he sat. It's recovered by Notre Dame. Flipping with Ohio State, which plays Penn State tonight on ABC. Here's third and three for Book. Finds a running lane and picks up the first down and more into Georgia Tech territory. Get three tight ends then as they run the ball straight ahead to Kyron Williams for the touchdown. His playing days are over. He is incredibly talented, going to be fun to watch over the next few years. No shot here, though, is to give himself that hole to go north and south. Glimpses of these freshmen to help us. We get a Dalen Hayes, another sack fumble. Guy's got incredible amount of energy on that sideline for Georgia Tech. Sims rolling out here on third and 14 and taken down to the backfield. First and goal. Flemister again, and he's in 6-0 and on the year now for Notre Dame. And 12 straight wins, the longest active win streak in FBS. Highlights never get old. Well, let's talk about the Clemson defense that Notre Dame will see this week. And join me now is Aiden Thomas of The Observer. Aiden, how you doing, my man? I'm doing great, Ryan. Thanks for having me back on. Before we move forward, what did you like most about that win at Georgia Tech? Uh, I liked – I mean, to be honest, watching that game, I felt just relaxed the entire time. I felt Notre Dame was just in control. They had a game plan coming in. They they pretty much did what they wanted on offense. I thought outside of the one fumble return touchdown that Georgia Tech had, without that, it's probably a 30, 35-point type game. So I really just felt – I just really liked what I saw as kind of a tune-up for the Clemson game this weekend. Well, and you mentioned that fumble by Kyron Williams. What I love is that coach put him back in the game. I think it's so important to maintain confidence of players. I played with a running back. He had one fumble in our first game, and he never played running back again. I mean, that affects players their whole lives, and I love seeing Coach Kelly put Kyron Williams back in there and, and allow him to produce as he has all year long. Well, let's look at this Clemson defense. Give us a top-down view just from about 50,000 feet up. What is this Clemson Tiger defense? Uh, it's. I mean, it's good. It's not as good as it has been in years past for Clemson when you think of some of the traditional, just uh, really elite defenses that Clemson has brought to the table. They've got a decent amount of freshman talent on defense. They've got Miles Murphy uh, coming on defensive end, and he has three and a half sacks, six and a half tackles for loss. So he's been really good. Uh, if you watch the end of the Clemson-BC game, you saw Brian Breesey, 
who had the game ending or basically game ending safety on Phil Dracovic. Uh He has three sacks as well in the year. So those are two freshman talents that will be uh, part of the pass rush for Clemson. And then in charge of run stopping will be Balen Spector, who's the grad student. He has six and a half tackles to loss, two and a half sacks. He's he's been one of Clemson's best linebackers for a couple of years now. And then looking towards the secondary, you'll look at Nolan Turner, who has three interceptions, and college football fans will know him from the guy that intercepted Justin Fields to end the college football playoff semifinal last year. So those are some of those top performers that Clemson has to offer this weekend. Well, you know, I'm checking you because I watched the film before, and Aiden, you're absolutely right. I look at this defensive line. I say, you got three freshmen on the defensive line against the number one offensive line in the country? All day long. And you're absolutely right. Balen Spector is fantastic when I watch the film. He does everything for him. And you're also right. They're just not as stout as you're used to seeing. I also like Jake Venables. He's another linebacker for Clemson. Who are some other key players that may not pop out right away with the stats that you that you see that Clemson could affect this game for Notre Dame? Yeah, absolutely. And Jake Venables was going to be one of the guys I was going to mention as well. Um, a couple – Booth Jr., he's got three tackles for loss and an interception. So he's kind of used, and he'll be used in a blitz package occasionally, <clears throat> used in a blitz package occasionally, but he'll also drop back and really, um, you know, Venables, the defensive coordinator for Clemson, he likes to confuse quarterbacks. And so Booth is a huge guy that does uh, does a lot of that for Clemson in terms of dropping into coverage and coming forth and bringing to opposing quarterbacks. Um, Mike Jones Jr., he's another guy with uh, multiple tackles for loss and interception. So he's another guy, him, Andrew Booth Jr. Those are some of the X factors for Clemson that um, Venables will try to use them in more uh, packages that will kind of confuse Ian Book. And you mentioned it earlier, Ian Book has such a mastery of the Notre Dame offense that confusing him or giving him, um, just making him second guess where he's going with the ball by um, throwing in different looks on defense is going to be key for Clemson. So using guys like uh, Booth or Jones could turn out to be key factors for Clemson. And lastly, Aiden, it's not enough to know about them. You got to know how to attack them, you know, right? You got to know how to attack them. What do you want to see from Notre Dame's offense this week to beat this Clemson defense? Yeah, I've, uh, so I, I noted two things I really wanted to see. And one of them starts with the run game, like it has with Notre Dame all year. Um, Bale Inspector, we mentioned, he's an absolute beast as a linebacker, but he's missing what Dabble Swinney called the other pair of the Bruiser brothers, is what he likes to call them, and James Skalski. James Kelsey is out with injury, and he's another fantastic linebacker for Clemson. So if I'm Notre Dame, I'm trying to figure out, you know, they used to have Spectre and, Sp- and Skalski, and so now there's going to be some room where the, where Spectre can't cover all of that. So you want to see Notre Dame really try to attack um, on the run game. We saw it last year when Skalski went out for injury in the national championship. The run game started to become a problem for Clemson to defend. So I want to see Notre Dame take advantage of that. And then the second thing I really want to see is I want to see them – throw the ball out of their two running back set. It's a look that Notre Dame's featured a lot this year with Williams and Tyree, but I haven't seen Notre Dame pass the ball, and I don't want to see Notre Dame come too predictable with a coach like Dabo Swinney, a defensive coordinator like Venables. I think that would, I would I think that'd be a bad look for Notre Dame coming into this game. Are you reading my mind? I mean, are you up here somewhere? Did you get that here in this pandemic? Because I'm with you. I mean, I saw, and we saw it just for one snap against Georgia Tech, Chris Tyree and Kyron Williams in there in the backfield, and you're, and you're playing, guess who's getting the ball? The defense has no idea. And then what about if those two go onto the line of scrimmage for a five wide with Tommy Tremble and Michael Mayer and Ben Skoranek? I don't know who's getting the ball, but I'm glad I'm not the defense. He is Aiden Thomas from The Observer. Aiden, as always, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it, Ryan. Thank you. And next, let's turn to Coach Kelly as he talks about the excitement and the preparation for Clemson Week. This is a long haul. I mean, this isn't a destination point for us this weekend is that we've got many more games. We're playing for a conference championship. And so it's not like when we were an independent and you need to kind of get these games to, you know, uh, validate, uh, you know, your place in the college football playoffs. We're, we're, we're looking at winning the conference championship and we have, you know, five conference games. So it's, 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 and they all count as one. And I know this is the number one team in the country. Our guys know it's the number one team in the country. They're excited about that opportunity, but it counts as one. And so you have to be able to balance that off because the next week gets at you immediately. 
Um, and if you empty the tank this weekend and you don't have anything left for BC, they're going to beat you <laughs> flat out. So there, there has to be a measure of emotional mastery here where you understand the opponent, you're excited about it, um, and, and, but you got to play your best. And, you know, that's what we've been building up for is, is that competitive greatness on Saturday, but still understanding that there's a lot of football still in front of us. Yeah, just like Coach Kelly says, I always think don't look past Clemson for Boston. Are you kidding me? Of course we're not. This is Clemson week, baby. This is what it's all about. All right, let's welcome in from the Observer. She joins us on a weekly basis, Charlotte Edmonds, who's no longer quarantined. Welcome, welcome back. Welcome when back from the embassy. Back. <laughs> Definitely glad to be back. Yeah. How, how many days did you have to spend there? I was in there for a full seven days. So okay. Sunday everything's Monday. okay though. Everything's fine. All, all negative and back in the dorm. So we're we're clear here. Did you get all your studying in? I mean, you probably wrote a couple of papers, plenty of time. I would like to say that I used my time productively, but I think I just watched a lot of TV and slept a lot. So caught up on some sleep, but otherwise we're back back into it. Basically what I've been doing for the last six months. All right, uh, <laughs> let's talk Let's talk about this uh, Clemson offense. And it's very difficult to assess an offense that doesn't feature Trevor Lawrence. And, and the immediate question is, how much of a drop-off is it? And and how much will one game under DJ Wingalele's belt, how much will that help him going into this game? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I hesitate to extrapolate too much from the Boston College game just because it is one game, but that's all we have to work with. So that's kind of what we're going off of. As far as the Trevor Lawrence factor, there's a lot being made of it as there should be. You know, he is a game changer. He is kind of once in a decade player that every program hopes to get. That said, this is Clemson, and they reload with five-star recruits. And Uyangalele, I'm going to give that a shot. Um, he's just that. He is another, you know, five-star recruit that Clemson brings in every year and has all the potential. So I think it's I, – I warn Notre Dame fans to not get too far ahead of themselves. Um, I think the biggest thing right now is trying to exploit his inexperience because – he clearly has all the skill sets and the talent. He just may not have that game management. So that will really be kind of, I think, the deciding factor in this game. He threw the ball an awful lot against uh, Boston College, but he had to because Clemson was playing catch up. In an ideal world, how do they balance their offense? I think in an ideal world, especially with Trevor Lawrence being out, they look to run the ball and considering they've got you know, Travis Etienne in their, in their back field. He's a absolute bulldozer, both as whether he's off the ball catching or taking it straight from the snap. So interestingly enough, he actually has nearly identical stats to Kyron Williams down to the yardage touchdown, everything. Um, I think he's a lot more threatening and he, where, um, Uyangalele kind of lacks in that experience. He's got four years under his belt. He'll be ready to kind of take the reins of this offense. So just as Boston College tried to contain the run game, I think Notre Dame, their best route going forward is also to try to contain the run game, knowing that they're going to look to turn to him a lot um, and trust that your secondary, trust that Kyle Hamilton will be able to shut down some of those deep balls and that your offense will be able to take care of things on the other side. That's Sorry. a Oh, go ahead. Let's let's talk a little bit about the uh, the playmakers uh, besides Etienne on that uh, offensive side. The receivers. I remember watching Clemson in in 2018 in the Cotton Bowl, and they were loaded at receiver. They had so much talent there. I mean, they have Amari Rogers. They got some guys who can ball, but I don't think they're as good. I don't think they're as deep as they were two years ago. I would absolutely agree. I think this is that is definitely their weakness. I mean. Travis Etienne is in is their second leading receiver, so you kind of know who you're looking at. It's him. It's him and Amari Rogers. Um, I hesitate on the flip side of that. Notre Dame's defense relies so their secondary relies so heavily on Kyle Hamilton, and I still remember Julian Love going out, and suddenly we were down thirty to three. So I hesitate to bank everything on one um, defender, but I think you're right. They simply don't have. The same, they they could just reload with receiver after receiver and wear down our secondary, and they don't have that same depth. 
All right, so if you're Clark Lee, if you're Notre Dame defense, how do you deal with Clemson's offense, given it's a young quarterback making his second career start? What do you do? I think you really try to pack it in along the defensive line. So you shut down the run game. You bring on a lot of pass rush. You you force him to make throws, force him to his left as um, Ryan was talking, you know, put, make him, make him make plays. He has the ability to move his feet, but he really torched Boston college in terms of um, throwing the ball. So you just bring pressure and you kind of start from the get go and you trust that your secondary will be able to hang with their receivers. I think the Boston college game is interesting as much as was made of Trevor Lawrence's absence the Clemson offense looked pretty good. The thing that kept Boston College in the game was that the Clemson defense couldn't stop them. So Notre Dame's going to have their work cut out for them. But I think you kind of pick up from their playbook and trust that your offense won't crumble the way Boston Colleges did, and you might have a chance in this. Charlotte, you're always a fountain of information. I envy you. I wish I could be at the game Saturday night. What a scene that is going to be. Enjoy Fair yourself, time. and we'll talk to you next week. Thank you. Bye. All right, up next, Dabo Sweeney, head coach of the Clemson Tigers. Last time he played the Irish, of course. Well, it wasn't a fun game for Notre Dame fans. I was there. Clemson, Cotton Bowl, two years ago. Here's how he remembers that game. You know, if you really watch the game, I mean, it was a, it was a you know, tough, tough game for both teams. But we just – we hit some really big plays and got control of the game. And, and uh, once we got control of the game, I mean, our defense, we're a hard team to – we're a hard team to come back on, and uh, you know. But you know, Ross had a couple huge plays. Renfro, uh, T, had the huge play right before the half, and next thing you know, it, boom, it's it's twenty-one to three or whatever. And and uh, you know, we were it was a pretty special group. But both teams, both teams were playoff teams, and uh, that was really the difference in the game that night. Uh, was just some big, few big plays uh, that we hit, and that, that and they didn't, uh, and they had some opportunities. So. You know, that's usually what it comes down to in those type of games is a few plays. I know sometimes you can look at the scoreboard and things and say, oh, well, you killed them. But it's usually just a few plays. Um, and, and in that particular game, it was a few big plays. Uh, so, you know, we were fortunate to win the game. But Notre Dame's excellent. And, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't know. How, I don't – let's see, when was that, 2018? I mean, how many games have they lost uh, since then? So, you know, they don't lose very much. I know that. Uh, so they're they're the fourth ranked team in the country for a reason. Uh, you know they've earned it. Uh, you know not just this year, but uh, all the way back. I mean, Brown's done an awesome job. They're incredibly consistent as a program, and uh, you know they believe in what they do and how they do it. And you know they just they've just won. That's really it. I mean, I don't really see anything different. I, uh, there, there's maybe there are a lot there. Of course, they had a bunch of veterans on that team, but you know they're still built in the trenches, both sides of the ball. Got an incredible OL and DL, uh, same quarterback. Got big guys at receiver that they throw 50-50 balls to. Tight ends are heavily involved and physical. Uh, good run game, obviously. That's how they're built. And then defensively, they get after you. So pretty much the same. You got to you got to win your matchups. Got to make some plays. You're not going, you're not going to just tiptoe through the lilies and beat these guys. You got to make some plays. Welcome to my favorite part of the show when I interview a Notre Dame legend, and this is one of my favorite people of all time. He's a college football Hall of Fame inductee. Was rated the 75th best player in college football history. He's a national champion, a Grey Cup MVP, a father to four, a husband to one. Please welcome someone everyone loves, Rocket Ishmael. Rocket, man, welcome to the show, brother. <laughs> What's good, Ryan? How you doing, brother? Man, it is always a treat to get to talk to you. And this week, Notre Dame has Clemson, who, oh, by the way, is on a 36-game win streak. But you played against a team called Miami who came into Notre Dame with a 36-game win streak. What was it like preparing that week, and what was the focus of your team to be successful? Okay, so for me, back in the day, uh, you know how they say ignorance is bliss. <laughs> and at that particular time, everything was, in my, in my understanding, it was like day-to-day. -day. I didn't have 
a grasp of the, the magnitude of this mighty Miami Hurricanes team coming into town. I didn't really understand what the upperclassmen, or, and it's like they were hyper-focused that week. You know, I'm just there along for the ride. So I do know that I know I was going to, to play my part, whatever that part would happen to be. And so it, it wasn't as drastic of as, as it wasn't as drastic of a um, was the, the way my the way I was feeling. It wasn't that drastic. It was just kind of another game. And Coach Holtz's normal uh, preparation for the team and and when you kind of look at it, it was he would tell us how amazing whoever we were going to play whether it was, you know, a perennial national champion or a team that was, was struggling to fill a, a Division I uh, roster. And he would always tell us how amazing they were and how we had to uh, make sure that we prepared so that we could maybe get to their level. And then by the end of the week, he would tell us something like, you know, this game isn't going to even be close. And <laughs> it was like uh, that that was consistent, you know. So it was like why he was telling us how great this team was, how fast they were, how powerful they were and all those things. It was just like I thought it was just coach speak until we actually got on the field. And I was like, oh, man, these guys are formidable. <laughs> but it wasn't nothing in us that didn't believe we weren't going to be able to have the the, the best uh, of ourselves that we're going to show up for that game and that we had a chance to win regardless of what their record was or how great they were. Well, and it, something happened before the game, though, as well that kind of helped out. To walk us through how the fight in the tunnel started. Okay. So <laughs> for us, I'm a freshman. So you, at the end of all of the warm-ups and the pregame, it was the freshman line. First, wait, wait, wait. First, I got to tell you. First, I got to tell you. First, I got to tell you. I remember during the pregame warm-ups, everybody lines up and their line, and you get right. ready to do calisthenics. You, you're warming up and everything. And then the other team, traditionally, they go around. So you come, they come out the tunnel, and they make a left. They go up their sideline. And then they go on to, I think maybe they split the field 50-50. Right. Or, or, or if you add the end zone, 60-60. And they were doing their warm-ups and everything on that side. And typically, every team goes up the sideline and they go onto the field and do their warm-up. Well, yo, they had this cat uh, linebacker, Bernard Clark, I think was his name, if I remember correctly. Yo, son was a beast. And I remember he, you could tell it was high level because he had on his Walkman and he had the clip to the Walkman. So it was clipped into his uh, football pants. He didn't have a jersey or anything on. And he had like a half shirt, like whatever you did for that part of warm ups. And he had his, his stomach showing. And he walked like through our ranks. So I was like, as a freshman, you know, I'm like, yo, this is this is highly unusual. And so this cat must be the man if he is, you know, walking right through us and not taking any regard for, you know, this is our warm up. So that that was kind of the pretext. Right. And so now we're coming to the end of our warm ups. Like I said, I'm a freshman. I'm close to the goalpost with. Let's see. I remember Rodney Cole, Rodney. Culver, no, Rodney Culver was on the field. Rod Smith, uh, Rusty Setzer, and maybe like Walter Boyd or somebody, another freshman. So we're in like the peon section of the line. And we're doing the last phase. All of a sudden, the Miami team, you could see they got done. It seemed like they got done a little early. So like every team normally does, they come to the left. And then they come down their sideline. Then if they get finished prior to us, they go behind us up into the tunnel. All I know is all of a sudden, like 
some massive human domino set, I feel from my left a pressure that was hard enough to knock me to the ground. And when it knocked me to the ground, I remember the crowd, which was really pumped up for this game, was like the 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 audio, somebody turned up the decibels on that mug. Mm -hmm. And I just remember the bleachers in the end zone were right there and we were able to actually touch the, the fans were right there. You could feel there wasn't any any wall or barrier between us. And I remember as I was trying to get up, just the noise level just went so high. And I felt some people fall on top of me. And I'm like, oh, man, this is getting serious. And so <laughs> one of the fans, uh, and it was crazy because one of the, 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 the fans that, that helped me up was a student. And I remember uh, getting pulled up. And as soon as I was like, hey, man, thank you, the, he looked me in the face and had like his eyes like rolled back in his head. <laughs> and he said, get him, Rocket, get him. <laughs> And I'm like, bro, this is pregame. I appreciate you helping me, but you're a little overexcited until I turned around, and I kid you not, it looked like one of the battle scenes from the movie Braveheart to me. Yeah. And I'm looking around, and there are guys punching and fighting and pulling and holding, and I was like, oh, my gosh. And so I look off to my left, and my roommate is in a tussle with this big guy. I mean, it was when I said big guy, I'm a little guy. I, at the time, I was probably about 5'8, 160. My roommate was shorter than me, little, a little heavier diesel. And all I know is like, oh, I got to help him. So I jump onto the back <laughs> of the guy. <laughs> Yes. I'm the guy that he that he's in a tussle with, and I'm telling you, <laughs> in in comparison, I heard a comedian once say that in one scenario, the effect that physically he had on this other guy was like somebody taking a tic tac out of their pocket and throwing it real hard at a whale. <laughs> what whale's not feeling anything? That is nothing. exactly what happened. It's like I hit a boom, nothing. So I'm like, oh, so I'm, I'm I'm tussling, trying my best to like get off my roommate, get off my roommate. Man, all of a sudden I feel the most authoritative strength room summer conditioning uh old man strength pull from the back, and I'm like, oh my gosh. This is the moment of truth. I have to go one on one. I'm gonna have to leave my roommate <laughs> to, to handle this big behemoth, and I'm gonna have to turn around and go for mine. Man, I turn around, get ready to fight. Man, it was like Indiana State Trooper. I was like, he's like, get back to the locker room, like, yes sir. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I go up in the locker room, right? Yeah. And all of a sudden, everybody starts filing in, filing in, filing in. Now this was unusual. Because, you know, Father Ryle was right there. He was uh, uh, giving us the blessing coming in. But after that, I didn't see anyone else as far as managers, coaches, right, anybody right. in authority. Even if, you know, normally you come up, you get last minute equipment checks or you might meet with your coach to go over some last minute detail or something like that. Nobody's in the locker room except the players coming in. And now everybody's coming in and it was just like, you could tell there was like a sense of pride and like excitement more than normal that, yo, this team that Coach Holt was, was building up to be so big and bad, they tried to test us. And it's like, yo, when you meet the challenge of a bully, you rise to the occasion. Mm -hmm. One minute, two minutes, five minutes. Whatever the amount of time is that you're in the locker room before the game, we start looking around like, oh, man, yo, nobody's here. <laughs> Where are the coaches? 
And then all of a sudden we started getting a little worried because yeah. Coach Holtz was really big on representing the university with class, not doing anything that's going to embarrass the university or your family. And if you broke any of those rules, and I'm not exaggerating, he would be quick. If we were in a away game and you broke some rules, you didn't, you weren't there by curfew or you didn't, you late to a meeting. I don't care who you were. He would put you on a flight back to South Bend and say, I'll see you uh, Monday when we get back into town, but you won't be playing today. Like he was on that kind of a level. So when we didn't see any coaches in, we were like, man, I wonder if he's going to cancel this game. <laughs> no if, way. If, if he's writing out a list of who's not going to play. Like, so now right. the excitement and all the adrenaline pumping, <laughs> it's like it becomes a little fearful. Man, the referee, you know how they come in. Uh, well, back, <laughs> back in the day, we had the old school locker room. <laughs> that was an old beat up wooden door from, that was on the steps going down into the, the play like a champion sign and then into the tunnel. So it was like somebody knocking on an old wooden door. Uh, <laughs> and it opened up. He's like, two minutes, coach, two minutes, coach. And there's no coaches in there. No coaches. I'm telling you, we are like, okay, what's going to happen? All of a sudden, you hear a door like it, it wasn't a door that was opened. It was either kicked open or somebody slammed it open like they were mad. And then so we look around and Coach Holtz walks in. His hat was pulled way down and his hands were in his pocket. And he used to walk really fast. And he was, a, a, a let's say, slight of stature. So yeah. when he's walking fast, he's kind of bobbing up there. And he gets to a part of the locker room where we usually meet before the pregame, and he gives us last-minute instructions. Got to that part, and we're kind of stuck, and he gives us whistle. Like, and I've said it many times, only well-trained dogs and his players could hear this whistle. I'm convinced of that to this day. <laughs> we go up, and he's pacing. And essentially, he said this, this. Now I'm paraphrasing what he said. Like, men, we're proud of you. You're gonna be. You're you're equipped. You're ready. You're gonna do just fine today. You're gonna do just fine today. And he mumbles a couple other things, and then he turned at the middle of the crowd, and he pointed at us. <laughs> he said, "But I want your ass to do me one favor." Say Jimmy Johnson just for me. <laughs> and we were sitting there like, what the savage? Oh, my God. Yeah, went nuts. We up, and it was like we just ran out of the field. It was like a, a, a confidence chaos everywhere. And we get onto the field. Turns out to be a game of the century, legendary game. We ended up winning the game, hard fought game. I mean, it was, it was, it was amazing. And from 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 that day to this, that was as far as football is my any football experience. That's my absolute favorite football memory of all time. Save Jimmy Johnson for me. What a moment and what a story. Well, Rocket, before we let you go, you know, a lot of supporters of Notre Dame and, and, and givers join this show and take part in it, but also love to watch it. What did it mean to you to be a Notre Dame man during and then after your career at Notre Dame? So now that I'm, you know, I, I tell my children, I'm like, you know, when you, when you turn 50, that's like the 20s of old age. So I'm in my fifties now and I think way different than I did back in the day. And one of the things that I realize when I think about, man, how did I even get to Notre Dame? Like the circumstances, what, what it means to me is God is real. Divine intervention is mm -hmm. real. 
and the part that humans play in bringing that divine intervention into manifestation in the earth is absolutely real. And for me to be able to have had the opportunity to be a part of the Notre Dame family, to be a part of the Notre Dame history, to be a part of just some magnificent times and the, the memories of people at Notre Dame, the significance of Notre Dame, the people, uh, divine intervention, and people choosing to share with me their resources, uh, their insights, their understanding, their guidance, putting together blueprints for me so that I could follow a map that would lead to Notre Dame. And then also the same people, you know, speaking into my life at an age where you're forming your imagination and your and, and, and the power that your imagination has, right. uh, all of these, like it's all of that. It means all of that to me. It's more than, 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 I ever imagined. And for all of us, it's it's like that when there are significant things that we are supposed to be a part of in our lives. The, you know, I tell people life is beautiful. This world is treacherous, but life is beautiful. And in order to overcome the treachery of the world, to overcome the evil of the world, to overcome the challenges of this world, there are people that have to come along to encourage you, to inspire you, to motivate you, to give you what is necessary so that you can become the significant and partake in the significant uh, institutions and things that you were called to before you even got here. So it's like, that's a very, for me, it's very nuanced when you say, what does Notre Dame mean to you? That's just a, a part of what it means to me. Well, you mean the world to the Notre Dame alumni. Congratulations on your college football Hall of Fame induction, all of your success, and I can't wait to see you next and hopefully give you a big hug after this pandemic. Thank you, Rocket. You're welcome, brother. Love you, man. Love you, brother. And next, Vic Lombardi's favorite part of the show, Vic Picks, coming up next. Time for your favorite segment and mine. It's Vic's Picks, and I want to thank Rocket Ismail. Um, Rocket, of course, was uh, – Man, in my opinion, um, I've watched nearly five decades of college football. The two most electrifying players I've ever witnessed on a college football field, Reggie Bush, Rocket Ismail. Reggie won the Heisman. Rocket should have won the Heisman. That's how good he was when Notre Dame won the national championship that year. All right, Vic's picks. You know how this works. Uh, you outpick me. You win yourself one of those fancy here come the Irish sweatshirts. Well, last week I was in a giving mood because you guys really weren't that competitive of late. So we gave away five of those sweatshirts. Congratulations to Albert Hummel, Ray Connell, Jacob Morse, Dave Mancinelli, and Father Bob Dowd. All bested me in Vic's picks. You win sweatshirts. Here's how it works. Uh, we pick the winner each week. Uh, see if you cover the spread. How many total yards will Notre Dame generate? And just for fun, then we'll, uh, we'll get the final score of each game. So... Let's get things going. Our first contestant on this week's VIX Picks from San Clemente, California, class of 88 from Friends of Ned and Ted, Steve Georgie. Steve, how you doing, my man? Great to be with you. You remember Rocket Ismail in 88. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. What did you think about him as a player? Every time he touched the ball, it was you're, you're, you're just wait for something special to happen. Yeah, he is just electrifying. Hey, I've got a good friend who was on the Air Force team playing on the sidelines. He saw Rocket catch the ball. The game plan was don't let Rocket return a kick. He turned his head. Next thing he knew, Rocket was in the end zone. Fastest thing yeah. he's ever seen happen on a college football field. No one got to the sideline or broke down that sideline faster than Rocket. You're exactly right. Well, yeah. 88 seems, uh, man, it seems just like yesterday, my friend. But uh, it's the last time a national championship is, uh, <laughs> has visited campus. It's about time we change that. All right. What are your picks this week, Steve? Well, hey, this is a team of destiny. This is the year. It's Notre Dame, of course and Notre Dame winning big. We've been saving it up. I was at the Cotton Bowl 
as, as you were two years ago, Vic. And we're really due for a big, big win. So, fifty-two to seven, Steve. Yeah, 52. I mean that's not a big win. That's that's like a the rest of the country will stop playing football, stop and watch that. Fifty-two to seven. I can feel it. Hey, I'm a product of Lou Holtz, just like you are. I can't I can't remember his exact quote, but it's time for the extraordinary, right? Yeah. Extraordinary across the team, ordinary to extraordinary. This is the Saturday. Steve, I hope you're right, buddy. Good luck to you, okay? All right. Thanks for having me on. Up next from the uh, Class of 15 Kavanaugh Council, representing the Galihu family, it's Tyler Van Voorhees from Chicago. Tyler. Hey, what's up, Chris? How are you doing? doing? Good. I'm great. What's, uh, what's that contraption behind you there? What, what's all that stuff? That's a Peloton, trying to stay in shape during quarantine here. Of course. <laughs> so how competitive did you get on the Peloton? Uh, probably more than I should. Yeah, yeah. Uh, everybody everybody I've talked to now has some semblance of a Peloton, either the real one or the uh, generic version, but everybody's got one of those during COVID. All right, uh, Tyler, what do you think this week? Are you going to be as <laughs> – I mean, come on, Steve went off the map there, 52-7. Are, are you as optimistic? You know, I'm not. I'm excited about the game. I think it's a win for Notre Dame. I originally had a score in 24-22 and a callback to that miserable hurricane experience in 2015. But I think with Lawrence out, it gives us a little bit more cushion and the win on the back of the defense here. Would you have preferred to see Trevor Lawrence play in this game? You know, I would have. And I was one of the idiots in 2012 that said, we want to play Alabama in the championship. And uh-huh. Um, I don't regret it, but I, I think it would have been more fun to come out of this with the legitimacy of a win against Lawrence. Well, that's not being idiotic. That's, you know, you, you have to stamp yourself as one of the elite teams. And the only way you do that is by beating an elite team. And this is a 100%. wonderful opportunity. Yeah, that's how it works. Tyler, thanks for your pick, buddy. Take care. Thanks a lot. All right. Up next, uh, we got a combo platter here representing the President's Circle, uh, Class of 89, Joe and Lisa is it Rimza or Rimza? Help me out here, gang. How do you pronounce Rim, it? It's Rimza. Perfect, Vic. Perfect. Rimza. And uh, fun fact, you guys are calling us here. Uh, you um, you were involved, Joe, in the construction of the famous number one sign that was perched atop Grace Hall. I'll never forget that when they got to number one. How, give us a little backstory on that. Yeah, it was unbelievable. Our rector at the time was Jerry Lardner, and he came up to us this and said, look, we had lived in Grace Hall before transformed into the admin building. And uh, he had come up to us, even though we were living off campus during senior year and, you know, reminded us of that uh, tradition. So sure enough, as soon as they um, they went to number one, we went to the lumber yard, the hardware stores, grabbed a bunch of guys together, and we were up on the roof of Grace Hall pulling it together to celebrate the uh, championship and, more importantly, the uh, vic- 31-30 victory over uh, Miami that year. Never forget that. Lisa, what dorm were you in? I was in um, PE. Okay. So you guys met, obviously, in school. Where would you meet? College of Engineering. Oh, okay. I see. So no <laughs> wonder you, you manufactured a number one side, Joe. I see how it works now. Right. Yeah. You know, exactly. I, don't, I don't know if you agree with me on this, Lisa, but I'll never forget when I was at Notre Dame and I was in Soren Hall, I was always so envious of the people who lived in Grace and the towers because didn't you guys have cable television? You were the first to have like ESPN and we never had it. And I was always so mad about that, Joe. Yeah, we had cable TV, and more importantly, we had air conditioning yes. for, the, uh, <laughs> for the summer and the uh, spring. That's right. That's, so did PE. Uh, uh, you, wait, you didn't have it in PE either? No, we no. had it in PE, but the thing about Grace and uh, those tower buildings is they also had epic SYR dances. Oh, they did? Mm-hmm. <laughs> they were Take very fun. Back. Take this back. All right, Lisa, you uh, get the show on the road here. Who do you guys like this week and how? Why? How much? Oh, Notre Dame for sure. And we went with the lucky score of 31-30. Oh, you stole one for me. I'd say that, that my score coming up is the exact score for that very reason. Oh, I, right. Uh, offensively, offensively, how many yards? I, I just saw the graphic. How many yards do you expect? Uh, we put down 430. Okay. Uh, Joe, did you and Lisa huddle up for these um, selections? How much How much thought went into this here? 
a lot. Lisa ran all the numbers, the tendencies against the Clemson defense and came up with uh, 430. So we feel really good about that. That's awesome. Well, I'm glad somebody remembers that game, 31-30. It is, in my opinion, the greatest college football game I've ever been in attendance. I mean, I don't know about you guys. It's still the greatest ever. Without question. Yeah. Joe and Lisa, thank you very much for your pick. We hope you win a pair of sweatshirts. Thank you. Thank you, Vic. Vic. Go Irish. Uh, Representing the Soren Society, a class of uh, 16 out of South Bend, right there, uh, Gracie Gallagher is Gracie with us. Hey, Gracie, how are you? Hi, Vic. Thanks for having me. How are you? I'm great. So you just decided to hang out in South Bend after graduation? Yep, I just couldn't leave. Yeah. What, what's, um, do you get to go to the games or have uh, only students? No, I do. I work for the university. So oh. I'm one of the lucky faculty staff that also gets to go. So I'll be there this weekend. How much more hype is a night game, by the way? The fact that this is a, is a late kickoff. It's beautiful, isn't it? Oh, it's so beautiful. And it's that time of year where the sun will be setting. So it's all under the lights and it'll be really exciting. And I can't wait. All right, Gracie, who do you like? I like Notre Dame. Um, I have us 27-24. actually have us um, last second field goal as time expires, driving down the field. Um, I don't have as high of an offensive yard pick as everyone else. I actually think it'll be more of a defensive battle. We'll sneak out some field goals, hopefully get a few touchdowns here and there. But um, I feel good about this. Uh, I've witnessed a lot of good and a lot of really heartbreaking uh, losses in Notre Dame Stadium all the years. So I'm optimistic about this one. Gracie, I'm still waiting for the first alum to pick against the Irish on a Notre Dame alum show. I don't think I'm going to see that. Not not today. Vic, my uncle and cousins and I do picks every year. We've been doing them since I was probably eight, and I've never picked against the Irish. So, <laughs> Thank you very much. Good luck to you. Thank you. All right, up next, representing the uh, Rockney Athletic Fund, class of 94, Terry Vital out of Lakewood Ranch, Florida. Terry, how are you? I'm great. How are you? Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you. Uh, it was just a few weeks ago we had uh, your pop, if those uh, those that don't know, Dick Vitale, correct? Dad was on the show. Yeah. And, uh, we, we loved interviewing him. So I need to ask you, how crazy does he get during the Notre Dame game? Does he get intense? Does he yell? What's it like? Yes, he do, he does all of it, and he's crazy. If anyone follows him on social media, he's ranting and raving on his all his social media platforms. But yeah, he lives and dies for the Irish. Every game, it's killing him that he can't go to games this year. But um, our daughter is a freshman there, so first grandchild to go to Notre Dame, and um, we actually all were up there for Florida State. Didn't get to go to the game, but we were able to visit. And um, yeah, we'll be cheering for the Irish this Saturday night. That's for sure. Congratulations! That's awesome. I'm just curious, how did the Vital family fall into the Notre Dame uh, tradition? Um, so both my sister and I were big tennis players and um, we were recruited by Notre Dame. And um, I'm the old eldest and went, uh, took a recruiting trip and went there, loved it. My sister followed and we both ended up marrying guys that we met at Notre Dame. So, uh, yeah, we live and die in Notre Dame. Outside of Regis Philbin, the late great Regis, your dad is the most passionate Notre Dame fan I know. So it's fun to see. All right, Terry, who do you like? Give us your your picks here. Well, come on. Of course, it's going to be the Irish 27-24. I don't, I, you know, I like Steve's pick at the beginning with that bold score, but, um, and I am a little more conservative on the offensive yards, but Nonetheless, I think it's going to be an exciting night game, um, reminiscent of what I remember my freshman year when we beat Michigan under the lights. And I'm um, just really looking forward to watching it on TV and cheering, ever seeing everyone in their green uh, green out on uh, Saturday night. Good stuff, Terry. Say hello to Pops for us, okay? I will. Thanks so All much. Right. Take care. Uh, representing now the uh, John Cardinal O'Hara Society, class of 92, Mary Osman. Mary, hey. how are you doing? Good. How are you, Vic? Good to oh, hear you. Great. I can't wait for the game Saturday night, to be honest with you. Uh, Mary, when you uh, took a look at this matchup at the beginning of the season, um, what do you think of Clemson, first of all? Do you, do you, do you fear Clemson? Are you Is this one of those teams you're like, oh, no, Clemson, or is all right, Clemson? How do you look at it? I think it's all right, Clemson. Like, yeah. you know, that's where we should be. That's where we should be playing. So I'm excited about it. So yeah. I'm with you. I mean, 
everybody who's like so afraid of playing these marquee games, you got to play them at some point, man. And that's why I, I wanted to see Trevor Lawrence play. How about you? Yeah, absolutely. Although my son told me we're in good graces by the fact that he's not going to be there. So, you know. Yeah, well, I'll tell your son, I'd like, with all due respect, you and Trevor have similar hairdos, by the way. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. yeah. I saw his uh, <laughs> I saw his long locks. He's got beautiful locks. He, he does. All right, give us your picks. Okay, so I am also going to go with 27-24. That seems to be a theme. So, um, and then I'm going to go with the total offense of 425 yards. So the, uh, the Irish are averaging about, what, 437 a game? Yeah, they're about. But they'll be in the green jerseys, so it'll be a good game. I think right, they're, so, they're so going to take it. Sister, you played a little golf. Uh, or your, Wait, do you live in golf or did you play golf? Am I reading this no, right? No, I, I live in golf. It's a little village in just by Southeast Glenview up in Illinois. So, oh, I thought you played golf. I was like, I, I also play golf, but oh, beautiful. Yeah, yeah yes. I mean, if you live in golf, you have to play golf. Yes, absolutely. You All right, do. get them straight, Mary. Thanks for your picks. Thank you. Uh, let's bring in Father Chris Brennan uh, from uh, Stanford Hall. He's the uh, the rector of Stanford Hall, representing the Congregation of Holy Cross. Uh, Father, I'm going to make this really easy on you. How do you pronounce the uh, young freshman quarterback for the Clemson Tigers? How do you pronounce his name? Oh, I think I've got his name here. Uh, Uangulele. That's pretty darn good. That is pretty good. That is a, that's better than what we heard from uh, Ryan Harris earlier. So uh, <laughs> you should be calling the game this week. Uh, what's the feeling like on campus? D does it feel different this week? Oh, you know, if if I'm honest. Um, I think everybody's a little bit tired. Yeah, <laughs> this has been a tough semester, but we had we've had some beautiful days. The trees are like at peak perfection. Um, yeah. This is always my favorite time of year is fall when you get these beautiful trees. Yeah, I yeah we've had great weather, and it'll be great weather for the game too. It, I was going to say the weather's supposed to be nice, and you're right. I was there last week, and the trees, and and I, I walked around St. Mary's Lake, and I just said, my goodness, does it get any better than this? And that's where you have an advantage as a Notre Dame fan and a Notre Dame player because. You hope that a lot of these Clemson guys, like Dabo Sweeney has never been to Notre Dame. He said mm -hmm. it. You hope that they they show up, they walk <laughs> around, and the mystique just gets to them, right? Yeah. Yeah. You hope it works, works wonders. Who do you like? Give us your picks. Well, you know, um, it's a little controversial here. I wasn't too sure when I uh, sent in my picks. Um, so I have a question mark there. But uh, I do think that we'll definitely cover the spread. And I think Grace, who was on here a little bit earlier, we have the exact same um, prediction, except for we're off by one yard, I think. She had 375, four, I've got 375. So, you know, I, uh, I'm i gonna say Notre Dame's gonna pull it out though. How, how could I be on this this uh, alumni show and uh, not say that Notre Dame's gonna win? Well, I mean, yeah, you can you can pick Clems and you'll be, never be invited back <laughs> on the show. But, I mean, you can no, do whatever but, you want. I, I think it's one of those games where it's gonna come down to the end and, um, I really hope I'll, I hope and pray uh, that it will be Notre Dame. Um, I love Lou Holtz's quote, right? God doesn't care uh, who wins this game, but his mother does. <laughs> and here's hoping that you will win one of those sweatshirts. Father, thank you. Appreciate it, bud. All right. Have a good All right. Up next, from the Order of St. Thomas More, class of 93, Patricia Carlson. Pat. Want to be known as Pat, correct? That's correct. How are you? I'm good, Vic. Thanks for having me. What do you have there in the background? What's your Notre Dame room look like? All right. Well, I'll tell you one thing. That's my grandfather, John McManman, who played, uh, graduated in 1928 and played for Newt Rockney for a few years. Oh, my goodness. Are you kidding me? I'm not what, kidding you. What kind of stories did he spin when you were growing up? Well, the best story he, tell, he used to tell uh, was he went to the 1925 Rose Bowl. Um, and he tells the great story. They they all went out there on a train, and they did all these whistle stop stops because back in the day they were the big the big story, and the crowds would gather in these small towns along the way out to California, and all the players would come out and sign autographs and all kinds of stuff like that. And he had some great stories about the antics the team got up to out in California, and you know, just endless amounts of great stories that he had. That must have been a week long trip on the oh, trip. Yeah. I think it was days, you know, honestly. 
but you know, that was, uh, they were they were famous. What great lineage! All right, Pat, who do you like? All right, well, I had a little help on these from my son, who's a junior, um, and uh, so I'm not going to lie, but I, I obviously was going to pick Notre Dame. I've never picked against them, so they're going to win. Uh, I've got them winning 27 to 21, beating the spread and 425 yards of offense. Nice numbers. That's not a bad look at all. 27 21. I think somewhere in that neighborhood, that ballpark is what I got coming up as well. Pat, great story about your grandfather. That's awesome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. All right. Last but not least, coming out of Ohio, class of 71, Fred Kuhar. Fred, did I get the name right, first of all? Right on. How you doing? I'm doing wonderful. How about you? I'm great. What's your Notre Dame room all about there? I see a few things behind you. Uh, the whole house is Notre Dame. In fact, I have I have a, a nine-foot sandstone logo on our back patio yeah, really. with gold sandstone and a blue ND logo. Do you, uh, do you get back for games often? Uh, yeah, uh, of course not this year, but uh, in the past uh, the past 20 years, I've been averaging five, six games a year. Beautiful. Okay, here comes Clemson. Undefeated, number one in the country, their backup quarterback. What are your numbers? Who do you like? Well, I like I like the Irish. I think they'll beat the spread, and uh, my yards are a little bit less than everybody else. Uh, and and I am typically skeptical. I mean, I, I wouldn't be afraid to pick against Notre Dame. I'd rather watch Notre Dame lose than anybody else win. But I think we're going to pull it out. I like those numbers. In fact, they're going to be very similar to mine, Fred. Best of luck to you, man. Hope you win a sweatshirt. Thank you. All right, take care. Uh, before we bring in uh, Ryan again, let me give you my prediction. Dick's picks. Um, they were stolen by the couple earlier. 31-30. Very reminiscent of 1988. One of the greatest college football games I've ever witnessed. When number one Miami comes in here with that monster win streak. They go to Notre Dame Stadium. Notre Dame returns a kick for a touchdown. Rocket Ismail electrifies the crowd. Notre Dame holds on to win that game 31-30. It takes fortune. It takes the ball bouncing your way. It takes great defensive plays. It takes perhaps the opposing running back getting called short on a would-be touchdown. It takes plays like that. Here's my pick, 31-30. Uh, yes, take care of the spread, obviously. 390 yards of offense, and that doesn't look like a lot of offense, but in these kind of games – you got to have defense. You got to have a pick six, a fumble for a touchdown, whatever it may be. You may not need more than 400 yards of offense, but that's my pick. Write it down. Hopefully you guys beat me for a sweatshirt. All right, before we bring back Ryan, here is our famous Notre Dame leprechaun to tell us about the importance of wearing green Saturday night. Everybody wearing green? On November 7th, wherever you are, the Irish wear green. Let's go! You heard the man, Ryan. I know you're going to be at the stadium calling the game. Oh, I got my outfit already picked up. I'm gonna need some more excitement from the the leprechaun, though. Am I, am I the only one there? Let's go! I mean, come on, let's well, go! I mean, it's Clemson week. Man. What do you want to do? He's inside there. They're studying. I mean, you can't make a mess out of that place. They're Notre Dame graduates, or they're Notre Dame students, which means that they've already got ninety percent of what they need going into a test. I'm gonna need more. Okay, from great. the leprechaun, Vic. I want you to deliver that message for me. Bro, uh, Father Brennan nailed the name of the quarterback. Now, I, I, I don't want to embarrass you again, 
but I'm going to give you one more shot. The Clemson's quarterback name. What is it? DJ Uyunglele. Good job. Close. <laughs> you, you just keep going and go. Uyunglele. It's calm down at the end there, but you're close enough. All right. You're so close so, so is it, is it, it's DJ Uyunglele. Uyunglele. Uwe Ungalele, like a yeah, ukulele, yeah, on, but a yeah. Uwe Ungalele. Yeah, you okay. threw on three or four more leles. He's okay, up on the yeah. I'm, I'm at, you know, I do like the leles. It feels okay. good to say. I'm not going to lie. But uh, you'll see me strumming my ukulele like DJ Uwe Ungalele on uh, Rally House uh, if you if you watch the, the Notre Dame broadcast this weekend. All right. When you, when you have this this game in your brain, how, how does Notre Dame win? What, what what How do you see it playing out? I see it playing out very boring early with Notre Dame being able to get a defensive stop and or a long sustained drive running the football, really starting to physically dominate Clemson and those three freshmen up front. And then I believe Ian Book will take over the game in the third quarter and start dicing up the Clemson defense and make it 38 to 21 Notre Dame. Wow. 38 points on that defense. That's almost. I'll tell you what. I mean, the games like this, though, Vic, you know, you just talked about it. You know, yeah. Rocket Ishmael running back the punt. I mean, things happen. You reach your – to win these games, you have to play your best. You really do. And the best for Notre Dame has yet to come. I believe we'll see that Saturday night. Well, I can't wait. Uh, enjoy it. I know you get to go out for it. Uh, night game even adds to the intrigue. Uh, the entire college football country will be watching this one. This is the marquee game on the schedule. Enjoy, my man. Bring back a win. And Will you know do, what? Vic. Now that I think about it, Brian Kelly's right. Brian Kelly's right. I think the last time a number one team came in here, came into South Bend, and the Irish beat them was Florida State. And then the following week, Boston College happened. And I'll yeah. never forget it. I think I, I'm, I'll never forget that loss with that kick. It looked like it was going outside back in. Win this game, and then we'll talk Boston College next week. But handle Clemson. I can't wait. Thanks, buddy. You too, Vic. Go Irish. All right. For Ryan Harris, I'm Vic Lombardi. Thanks for watching. Here come the Irish to let you out the door here. We've got a clip from the Notre Dame Glee Club. Notre Dame and fight for gold and blue. 